thanks very much for being here. Thanks especially to Frida uh, for inviting me to be a part of this symposium. And thanks to everyone here at Yale for making this possible. My name is Izzy Kornblatt, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the third and final panel of the day, Make No Big Plans, South Street versus Co-op City, which will include papers presented by Sarah Moses, Joan Ackman, and Frida Gran. Before turning things over to the speakers, I want to say just a few words about the title of the session. Make No Big Plans is, of course, an inversion of Make No Little Plans, the famed saying by Daniel Burnham. Until a few years ago, the source of Burnham's saying was unknown, and as a result, it was often thought to be apocryphal. But in 2019, the Chicago writer Adam Seltzer discovered the full transcript of an October 1910 Burnham speech, and there, at its conclusion, was the famed quote. In full, Burnham said, make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably will not themselves be realized. Make big plans, aim high in hope and work, remembering that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, but long after we are gone will be a living thing, asserting itself with an ever-growing insistency. As I believe Frida will describe shortly, it was Denise Scott Brown herself who flipped Burnham's phrase, arguing that planners in her own time instead make little plans. Reacting against the brutalities of urban renewal, Denise made the case for targeted interventions rooted in a multi-layered understanding of a place and carefully considered to avoid harming those without the power to stand up to development authorities. In a few minutes, Sarah will explore how Denise did exactly this in her work with Philadelphia's South Street. And Frida will show, sorry, Sarah will explore how Denise did exactly this, and Frida will show how Denise brought her argument to a 1978 conference in Switzerland marking the 50th anniversary of SIAN, the Congress for Modern Architecture that was not exactly known for advocating sensitivity to local communities. But as Joan's essay on Denise's defense of the vast co-op city development suggests, Denise did not categorically reject big plans. Indeed, one of the virtues of the Toulouse provincial capital that Denise and Bob designed in the 1990s is the boldness of Denise's central gesture, the open diagonal axis that cuts across the site. It calls to mind Burnham's suggestion that a noble logical diagram once recorded will never die, not least in that after the complex was under construction, a historical map came to light showing that centuries earlier, a street had crossed the site in almost the exact same place. If we dig a little bit deeper into Burnham's speech, more similarities between his ideas and Denise's start to emerge among them a deep concern for civic welfare and the public good. It is on this account that Burnham extols the virtues of parks and calls for a future city without smoke, dust, or gases from manufacturing plants, out of which, he suggests, will come not only commercial economy, but bodily health and spiritual joy. Six decades later, Denise wrote of her admiration for Burnham's conception of the city as a set of urban systems, a plurality and an ordered complexity. But planning for that plurality had, by her time, become a far more fraught affair as questions of the exercise of power and the construction of taste complicated the notion of the public good upon which Burnham unquestioningly relied. These three papers help illuminate how Denise probed these difficult questions in the 1960s and 1970s and the resulting non-doctrinaire approach that she put forward in her own work. I'd now like to briefly introduce our three speakers in presenting order. First off, Sarah Moses is a second year PhD student in architecture at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Her recent work analyzes efforts to spatialize ideas about race through segregationist practices at beachfront leisure sites in the Northeastern United States. She holds dual Master of Architecture and Master of Science in Historic Preservation degrees from the University of Pennsylvania, where her research focus was conflict between the collective desire to memorialize and a protective impulse to stigmatize, sanitize, or obliterate sites with traumatic or violent associations. Prior to starting at Harvard, she worked for five years as a public architectural historian for New York City's Landmarks Preservation Commission. Joan Ackman is the Vincent Scully Visiting Professor in Architectural History and leads Yale's PhD program in architecture. 
She is an adjunct professor at the University of Pennsylvania and previously taught at Columbia University for over two decades and served as director of Columbia, Columbia's Temple Hoyne Buell Center for the Study of American Architecture from 1994 to 2008. She began her career at the Institute for Architecture and Urban Studies in New York, where she was an editor of Opposition's Journal and was responsible for the Opposition's book series. Among her many edited publications are her award-winning anthology, Architecture Culture 1943 to 1968, The Pragmatist Imagination, Thinking About Things in the Making, and Architecture School, Three Centuries of Educating Architects in North America. She was named a fellow of the Society of Architectural Historians in 2017. And lastly, as many of you remember from earlier today, Frida Gran is an architect, architecture critic, and architectural historian, and the convener of this symposium, as well as the editor of Denise Scott Brown in Other Eyes, Portraits of an Architect. She holds a Master of Science in Architecture and a Master of Advanced Studies in the History and Theory of Architecture from ETH Zurich, and her writings have appeared in a variety of journals. In addition to her work as an architect and project manager in Swiss architectural firms, she has lectured at universities in Switzerland, Sweden, and Germany. She co-curated the exhibition Territory as Palimpsest, the legacy of André Corbos at the Academy of Architecture in Mendrisio, Università della Svizzera Italiana, apologies for my pronunciation, where she is writing a doctoral thesis entitled The Swiss Reception of Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, 1970 to 2000. I'll now let Sarah take it away. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's an honor to be here um, among people whose work has meant the world to me, whose support um, and whose thoughtful writing um, I've, I've benefited from tremendously. Um, in preparation for being here today, I did read my first draft and screamed out loud in horror to no one. Um, I want to thank Frida especially for her kind and careful and very patient editing. Thank you. Um, I speak first of the power of the planner's pencil. Um, in 1946, as he later made clear to the interviewer Lenora Burson, the Philadelphia Planning Commission Executive Director Robert Mitchell, and I quote him, picked up a pencil and drew a line across a map. That line became the Crosstown Expressway. The Crosstown was to complete a circuit of center city Philadelphia that the Schuylkill, Delaware, and Vine Street Expressways were otherwise to form. Over time, the line was made thick under the supervision of Edmund Bacon, the commission made the route a prominent element of its vision in the 1947 Better Philadelphia exhibition for redevelopment of center city due to apparent blight. By 1955, the route was planned as a 2.8 mile, eight lane depressed highway to replace Bainbridge and South Streets. And you see it, oh, that's terrible. Um, you see it referred to as the South Street Expressway here rather than the Crosstown. Um, the threat of these streets erasure was uh, close and it was palpable. Residents were sent notice from the Department of Highways that the department, and I quote here, finds it necessary to acquire the rights of way to their properties and frame their removal as an eventual requirement. This photograph from Marcus Anthony Hunter's Black City Makers shows an exit sign fabricated and installed on I-95 for the then still unbuilt Crosstown Expressway. In 1967, as the specter of the Crosstown Expressway drove disinvestment in the area under threat of obliteration, the activist Alice Lipscomb and civic organizer George T. Dukes, both Black residents due south of the streets to be cut out and across by the Crosstown, co-founded the CCPDCC, the Citizens Committee to Preserve and Develop the Crosstown Community, to link disparate constituents in their opposition to the Crosstown Expressway scheme. And that is Alice Lipscomb um, at, the, at the front of the protest uh, in the image at left. In 1968, this crosstown community sought to refocus its energies from protest alone to the active rehabilitation of the corridor under threat and contracted with the office of Venturi and Rauch 
in the person of Denise Scott Brown to devise a counter plan to the expressway. Scott Brown set her wayward eye on South Street, her camera an instrument to dismantle fictions of the old Seventh Ward, which South Street in part defined as Hell's Acre. Her photographs capture a streetscape that both invites and gratifies a viewer's repeat glance with vignettes that operate almost as metaphors. Half hidden but ebullient ornamentation laces the underbellies of storefront vaults. Signage reassures passersby that imperfect shoes in neat arrangement are fine rejects. Butcher shops advertise chitlins, pig's feet, and neck bones and offer discounts to church parties, soul food staples to meet the work of the soul. And a pile of storefront detritus uplifts a poster on which a caricature of Uncle Sam proclaims in text just visible beneath cast off material. There is no place just like this place anywhere near this place, so this must be the place. That sentiment was not first put forth in reference to South Street, but might as well have been. I spoke of the power of the planner's pencil at the start of this talk, and pencil is perhaps a bit anachronistic here, but South Street as Cedar Street was drawn as the southmost frontier of the city of Philadelphia in 1683, the limit between the surveyor's aspirational grid and cartographic blankness that effaces the presence and influence of Lenape peoples. From the 1790s, South Street became home to a free black public in the province of institutions built to rebut exclusion and discrimination elsewhere. After emancipation and in the great migration, influxes of black migrants came to augment these communities in the old seventh ward. From the 1830s, as newcomers to Philadelphia sought work on the waterfront, or in Washington Avenue manufactories, successive immigrant enclaves made homes on South Street. From the mid 1910s, South Street was a bastion of black commerce and entertainment manifest in iconic venues like the Standard and Royal Theaters. In fact, the closure of the Royal Theater in 1970 was in part a consequence of disinvestment due to the longtime threat of South Street's clearance for construction of the Crosstown Expressway that Scott Brown's counter plan was counter to. Scott Brown's South Street counter plan was contemporaneous with and invites comparison to the better known work in Las Vegas. In another of her photographs of South Street, the concertina effect of signage, billboards for groceries, patent medicine, watch repairs, hardware, records, and shoes, alongside imperative curbside communiques to automobile users offers a glimmer of the fascinations that characterize learning from Las Vegas. The South Street contract for the office came with the Crosstown Community Advisor, Janet Chef Reiner's incisive remark. And I quote her here, if you can like Las Vegas, we trust you not to neaten up South Street at the expense of its people. In interviews and publications, as Craig Lee spoke about uh, earlier today, um, Scott Brown makes reference to her African view of Las Vegas, an inducement to learn from the landscape as a result of an awareness of a dominant valuation of culture at odds with a homegrown ethos in her experience of South Africa, and I quote her, between the polite England dominated views of what art, landscape and culture should be and those derived from what was actually around us, in my case, the Welt, Johannesburg and African cultures as they hit the city. As in the Las Vegas work, Scott Brown's appreciation for what was rather than what ought to be saturates the minimum intervention strategies of her South Street counter plan. Although Venturi and Scott Brown were then residents of the IMP designed Society Hill Towers built as the centerpiece of a clearance and redevelopment scheme due north of South Street, their engagement with South Street was intimate. The pair were then dependent on an inheritance from Robert Venturi's father, 
the Venturi fruit and produce business at 1430 South Street for an income. In fact, in the counterplans photo montage of South Street, Venturi store trucks are visible where uh, the pink arrows are. For the firm, the South Street counterplan was a potential generator of future business, a milestone as what Scott Brown refers to as the first community project we undertook as practitioners, not academics, and a test site for theories about Main Street. In reminiscences, Scott Brown frames South Street as, quote, a commercial strip at the scale of Main Street. It could in fact be called the Main Street of Philadelphia's center city black community. In public testimonies, opponents to the Crosstown Expressway scheme drew attention to its disparate impact on black residents. Construction of the Crosstown was liable to displace 6,000 or more individuals, 90% of whom were black. In 1964, the real estate broker George Scott made repeat reference to the Crosstown Expressway as Philadelphia's Mason Dixon line. The Crosstown community co-founder George Dukes spoke of the expressway as a tactical moat, um, a defensive imposition drawn from above from the omniscient perspective of a planner's aerial maps and route plans. Opposition to the expressway in public hearings in May 1964 came mere months before a black citizen's revolt to counter police violence in North Philadelphia, one of the first in a series of actions across the United States that rose to a zenith in the long hot summer of 1967. In 1967, in fact, objections to a store owner's discrimination against black customers on South Street were met with injunctions to obstruct their protest. Commissioner of Police Frank Rizzo oversaw the deployment of 500 police officers in riot suits to quash nascent unrest in the streets. In one of Scott Brown's photographs, the watchwords black power writhe across a vacant storefront in aerosol paint. A viewer senses that invisible to the camera, the assertion of black presence under peril of abuse and obliteration render the air electric. Scott Brown later wrote that on South Street and in other early projects, and I'm quoting her again, social change and the unrest that went with it dogged my steps in every place. Fortuitously, the lessons learned in one tied neatly to the next, and many questions resolved themselves in planning school during the civil rights movement. One aspiration of pro-Crosstown Expressway forces was to have the thoroughfare serve as a convenient conduit for Philadelphia's bicentennial celebration of 1976. In Scott Brown's prose, a clear and alternative conception of the bicentennial as an occasion to celebrate black histories in Philadelphia is evident. The very first page of her counterplan asserts, and this is a quote, we recommend that South Street's importance historically and culturally to immigrant groups and particularly today to Negro culture be spelled out for the bicentennial in a manner that matches Society Hill. In addition to measures meant to ensure residents access to health care, education, recreation, and commerce, the document proposes the institution of a museum of slavery, a museum of immigrant culture, and a promenade of Negro culture and history. Scott Brown's research shows a consideration of historic preservation tactics and the mechanisms to formalize them, here just at the cusp of the development of academic preservationist disciplines in American graduate programs. The text of her counterplan prioritizes the involvement of South Street residents themselves in rehabilitation efforts with specific reference to black business owners. It's um, a bit hard to see in my uh, iPhone photo from the archives um, at Penn, but uh, this is recording and analysis of community structure, um, public amenities, facilities, and street level uses to inform and situate minimal targeted interventions. One reporter's conclusion from Scott Brown's presentation of the plan was that I quote, 
Conservative surgery can still save the life of South Street just in time to give it a major role in the bicentennial celebration as a model thoroughfare of Negro culture past and present. Another wrote, the plan is civic design of such sensitive and sensible sort that it is radical. In his iconoclastic sociological work, The Philadelphia Negro of 1899, W.E.B. Du Bois, then a resident of a settlement house just a half block north of South Street, wrote that the seventh ward, and I quote, wrote of the seventh ward, on its face, this slum is noisy and dissipated, but it is not brutal. The stranger can usually walk about here day and night with little fear of being molested if he be not too inquisitive. Echoes of Du Bois are audible in Scott Brown's characterization of South Street in 1971, and here I quote her. For all its decay and for all the evidence of social and individual distress, South Street is a lively, lovely piece of city, more capable of endearing itself to the imagination than the more famous but less vital Society Hill area bordering it. Scott Brown's reverence for South Street as it was is evident in the qualities of her photographs. Comedic or poetic kismet, singular alignments, tenderness made immortal on film, and in her incorporation of elements then extant on South Street in her party. Her sketch of West Center, one of the service nodes she proposes at the start of the plan, orients the view above a fire hydrant like the ones that rise from sidewalks throughout her photographs. It outlines South Street's vernacular row houses with their telltale fire escapes, sills, cornice brackets, and adjacent to the center's entrance, it incorporates a storefront church, the Unity Church, in fact, that appears in her photographs. She did not push her pencil through people's homes and businesses and sites of worship. She drew them. Scott Brown later wrote, and I quote her, our drawings and maps, although meager because of lack of funds, proved evocative. They were perhaps better than more explicit drawings since people could fill them with their own dreams. A dreamscape requires imagination to activate. Even more so, it requires time, a resource the pragmatic crosstown community activists were unable to lavish. The dreamscape became subject to refinement with coalition members' input, as Scott Brown wrote, and I quote again, I was surprised when I learned the community did not wish my transportation plan to be shown. The community vetoed one other scheme. Some architects recommended getting donations of paint and painting all the side walls of houses where buildings had been demolished on the street. The community said, if we had enough people with the ability to organize doing that, why would we waste their time on something so futile? We need them for other things such as banging on the mayor's door. This respectful repartee between the activist residents and Denise Scott Brown was the fundament of successive iterations of the work. And I quote her again here. So I began to learn interesting and important lessons in planning from the members of this low income black community helped by their brilliant leader, Alice Lipscomb and their brilliant and merry lawyer, Robert Sugarman. Scott Brown came to recognize her value not as an impassive, impassive visioner, but as a collaborator. Rather than dominate the conversation under the aegis of her expertise, Scott Brown put her credentials to use in her role as an interlocutor, and I quote her. Our value to the committee now was that as professionals, we could say with authority that the area had architectural, architectural value and potential and deserved preservation. In a 2013 interview, Scott Brown reflects on the South Street work saying, I got my best lessons in urban planning, I would say, from that low income community and the way they thought and the canny way they could see their own needs. Scott Brown's radical minimum intervention, incremental growth proposal can be seen as an embodiment of Jane Jacobs exhortation, which I quote here. 
The least we can do is to respect in the deepest sense, strips of chaos that have a weird wisdom of their own, not yet encompassed in our concept of urban order. From her work on South Street, Scott Brown came to see that, quote, beauty could emerge from the existing fabric and that a not too apparent order should be sought from within instead of an easy one imposed from above. This South Street counter plan was never realized. Nonetheless, its development from 1968 to 1972 bespeaks collaboration, communion, and more than appreciation, celebration of what was rather than what ought to be. In interviews, Scott Brown repeats that the work was done, quote, with lots of love and with heart and soul, a remarkable throwback to the project lesson she wrote just after its completion and that I conclude with here. The architect or planner cannot work from the inside in the city unless he first learns to love it. For the life of its people and for the messy vitality of its body. Without this second love, the first will be theoretical indeed. Thank you. Hi, Denise. It's wonderful to see you too. And I'm looking forward to your comments after this. And in fact, I, I'll begin by, um, by saying that uh, Denise has said that the idea, the, the thesis of the duck and the decorated shed occurred to her and Bob as they were commuting up to New Haven from Philadelphia to teach here and looking out the train window and seeing the vernacular industrial buildings, and then of course arriving here at the a and building. Uh, and that led to the, the duck in the decorated shed. And um, I, I should tell you that commuting up to teach at Yale these days uh, from Philadelphia and looking out the window going north on the left and seeing Co-op City um, has in some ways prompted the talk I'm about to give. So um, among the various learning from paradigms put forward by Denise Scott Brown and Rob, Robert Venturi, starting in the late 1960s, the most celebrated is learning from Las Vegas, the design studio they taught with Steven Eisenhower here at Yale School of Architecture in the fall of 1968, and the book of the same name that resulted four years later. Another studio at Yale, Remedial Housing for Architects or Learning from Levittown followed the one on Las Vegas in spring 1970. In December 1971, an article by Scott Brown, Learning from Pop, published in the Italian journal Casabella, reprised the theme. And this last uh, begins, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, Levittown, the swinging singles on the Westheimer Strip, golf resorts, boating communities, co-op city, the residential backgrounds to soap operas, TV commercials and mass mag ads, billboards and Route 66 are sources for a changing architectural sensibility. Co-op city related neither to the commercial strip and its signage, nor to pop culture and its media, nor to the ordinary suburban landscape, Co-op City seems an outlier in the list. Yet an article by the two Philadelphia architects published in Progressive Architecture Magazine in February 1970, titled Co-op City, Learning to Like It, makes the case for a massive housing project then under construction in New York City as an object lesson in the virtues of ordinariness and popular appeal. Architects should learn to accept the ordinary on its own terms and do it well, the co-authors write, and quote, to give the people something they want. Signed Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi in that order, Co-op City Learning to Like It has the earmarks of having been written principally by Scott Brown. Among the giveaways are a couple of passing references to housing developments in apartheid South Africa. Documents in the architectural archives of the University of Pennsylvania confirm our suspicion. More on one of these in a moment. 
When the, what the article shares with the Venturi's other exemplars of the almost all right is an, orth, an unorthodox and contrarian take on a type of built environment vilified by the architectural elite and the press. An early draft of the article dates to December 1968, a couple weeks after the New York Times ran a front page story on the imminent opening of Co-op City's first high rise apartment block. The milestone was marked by a dedication ceremony attended by such New York notables as Nelson Rockefeller and Robert Moses. Accompanying the news story was a design review by the Times' architecture critic, Ada Louise Huxtable, titled A Singularly New York Product. Um, and Huxtable disparages the development for lacking both adequate site planning and inspiration. Leading critics in other publications echoed Huxtable's assessment, describing it as sterile and blunt, that was Walter McQuaid, and fairly hideous, Peter Blake. <laughs> Taking a characteristically contrarian stance, Scott Brown and Venturi arrayed themselves on the side of the giant development, explicitly endorsing the dominant post-war policy ruthlessly implemented by Robert Moses and other power brokers in cities across the US in the name of urban renewal. Built to house between 55,000 and 60,000 residents in 55 brick towers, unadorned save for some concrete styling and ranging in height from 24 to 33 stories, some up to two blocks long, the buildings of Co-op City sprawl, uh, sprawled across a 300 acre site located in the northeast reaches uh, of the Bronx at the intersection of Interstate 95 and the Hutchinson River Parkway. Sprinkled among the towers were seven clusters of townhouses added at the behest of the City Planning Commission to give a modicum of human scale plus three shopping centers, a 25 acre education park with schools, a power plant, a credit union, a library and movie house, religious buildings and eight immense private garages. Laying claim when it opened to being the largest cooperative housing complex in the world, it was a veritable city within the city. Had it been an actual municipality, it would have been the 13 largest in New York State. A venture of the United Housing Foundation, the UHF, a not-for-profit consortium of labor unions, housing co-ops, cooperatives, and neighborhood associations established in 1951. It was designed by Herman Jesser, an architect born in a part of the Russian empire, now Ukraine, and longtime veteran of the organization who began his career as a draftsman in the 1920s and by the 1970s completed some 40,000 units of cooperative housing in New York City. The UHS mission was to provide affordable apartments to its constituency of middle and model, moderate income workers in the garment and other labor unions. Heavily subsidized by both the state and city, the construction of Co-op City was paid for with a long-term low interest mortgage worth a record $330 million and a, a, 50, a sorry, 30 year tax abatement financed under the mitchell Lama Act, an affordable housing program introduced in 1955. To qualify for residency, prospective cooperators had to have an income of no more than seven times the annual carrying charges on their apartment, which amounted to $27.50 per room per month, including utilities and air conditioning. In return, they, retur they retained only limited equity in their unit. Jessor and his team kept costs to a minimum through economies of scale, scrupulous budgeting and scheduling, 
and especially the UHF's practice of serving as its own contractor. Combined with an uncompromisingly no frills approach to design, this formula enabled the UHF to provide Co-op City's residents with functional and relatively spacious interiors, which even Huxtable uh, and other skeptics subsequently had to admit, admit meant good apartments at unbeatable prices. Besides its association with organized labor, Co-op City also differed from most other urban renewal projects in that it managed to avoid the brutal displacements notoriously associated with slum clearance. The marshy site on which it stood uh, was previously home to a theme park called Freedom Land that opened in 1960 and went bankrupt in 1964, taking down the famed real estate mogul and financier William Zeckendorf with it. Brainchild of a former Disney designer, the park was dedicated, as its name suggests, to mythifying American history through creative imagineering. One might have expected Scott Brown and Venturi to have been more enamored of Freedom Land than its uningratiating successor. Ironically, at, a moment, at an intensifying moment in the Cold War, early articles on Co-op City did not fail to suggest similarities between the New York behemoth and the mass produced housing being erected at the same date on the outskirts of Moscow. Scott Brown uh, and Venturi's brief um, on this one, brief on uh, behalf of Co-op City was essentially an argument that the urgent demand for affordable housing in contemporary American cities necessitated dispensing with architectural niceties. Contra the pieties of the design profession, and in contrast to the self-indulgence of both avant-garde formalists and technological utopians, what people basically wanted and needed, they claimed, was a decent place to live. Nor was there any hard evidence that good design and civic beauty neatly correlated with social cohesion uh, and community. Channeling a critique made by Scott Brown's teacher, Herbert Gans, actually in his review of Jane Jacobs, uh, Death and Life of Great American Cities, and indeed earlier by Adolf Loos, who'd made a distinction between monuments and cemeteries on one hand and all other buildings on the other, they made the case that the argument for aesthetics rested on a physical fallacy. While projects of unique civic importance might warrant a degree of embellishment, ordinary buildings did not. Quote, our contention is that architects spend too much time on decoration, not decoration in the traditional sense that might cost less, but in the sense of contorting what should be ordinary building to fit preconceived high style models based on the work of Le Corbusier, Kahn, Rudolph, and other admired masters." Unquote. The issue, in other words, already formulated by Scott Brown in, initial ver in an initial version of the couple's duck versus decorated shed thesis boiled down to simple arithmetic. What price aesthetics? This faute de mieux realism also jived with the philosopher of Jessor. Although for the architect of Co-op City, the towers in the park typology, a distant trickle down from the urbanism of Le Corbusier reflected his firm belief in the latter's inherent superiority to any alternative. For Scott Brown and Venturi, it was more a matter of eat your spinach, learning to like it, almost all rightness. At the same time, Jessor insisted on taking some distance from the couple's arch attitude toward modernist orthodoxy. A tireless activist on behalf of affordable housing, 
and thin-skinned about criticisms of his work, Jessa bristled at their suggestion that there was a 30s air overhanging Co-op City. Invited by the editors of Progressive Architecture to write a rebuttal uh, to their argument, he offered a series of comments that are appended at the end of the article. I'm quoting, New Deal liberalism was a giant step forward in American society, he affirms. It gave us social security, the minimum wage, welfare relief, and government-aided housing. The final solution to housing for the masses is that it be a government function. The success of the United Housing Foundation testifies to this need, housing without profit. Predictably, a very different reaction came from the other end of the professional spectrum. Having brazenly stirred the pot, Scott Brown and Venturi's article elicited outraged letters from a number of progressive architectures readers. The editors chose to publish two of the more indignant ones in the magazine's April issue under the heading Co-op City Controversy. The first came from Sybil Maholi Naj, who was teaching at the time at Columbia University. Not mincing words, Maholi Naj pointed out the article's contradictions with Venturi's argument in Complexity and Contradiction in Architecture, which had appeared four years earlier, declaring it, quote, profoundly shocking that an architect whose primary inspiration would seem to have come from the urban facades of Italy should so cleverly ignore the deadly anti-urbanism of this project. The second letter came from architect Ulrich Franzen, who likewise expressed shock. Couching his response in terms of recent political events, he denounced the author's endorsement of status quo doctrine, declaring that, quote, one year after the election of the Nixon administration, the defense of co-op cities coarsely scaled and lifeless community on grounds of lowest cost, cost and the implied endorsement of existing subsidy policies, unquote, raised quoting again, the ghost of a silent majority architecture. Several months later, Scott Brown responded to both Maholi Naj and Franzen with her own broadside. Dated 4 September 1970, the six page letter uh, addressed to editor in chief Forrest Wilson at Progressive Architecture went unpublished. A carbon copy conserved in the Penn archives begins by complimenting Maholi Naj for her previous sensible and refreshing critiques of the latest architectural and planning dogma. But she, Scott Brown, goes on to castigate Maholi Naj for endorsing architect designed social housing that quote, cannot be afforded by the majority of the urban workforce. As to Franzen's quote, currently fashionable Nixon silent majority critique, Scott Brown states, quote, there seems to be a very fine line between liberalism and class snobbery. Scott Brown concludes with a pointed comment on, quote, the question of ascription. After initially referring to Venturi and his wife, Maholi Naj had used the masculine pronoun throughout her letter to the editor, while Franzen had ignored Scott Brown's contribution altogether. Scott Brown undertook to set the record straight. Quote, I wrote the article. It contains an inseparable amalgam of our shared opinions, but owes as much to my planning experience and research in housing here and particularly in development areas as to either of our architecture, as, as much to that as to either of our architectural theories. For the record, one of us writes the first draft, the other adds, criticizes, and edits. Whoever is named first wrote the first draft. This is a fairly standard academic procedure. Missing its implication implies a male chauvinism, which can be expected from the Franzens of the profession, but hardly from the wife of Laszlo, misspelled Maholi Naj. 
clearly Co-op City learning to like, like it touched hot buttons. Half a century later, at a time when affordable housing, urban housing remains as desperately needed as ever, judgment on Co-op City may still need to be deferred. While the complex has had its share of problems over the years, from construction issues to rent strikes and financial scandals, the pragmatic idealism or ideological, uh, sorry, idealistic pragmatism that originally underwrote Herman Jesser and the UHF's conception cannot altogether be dismissed. One former resident, Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who moved to Co-op City as a teenager from a more dangerous and decrepit area of the Bronx, recounts in her 2013 autobiography, quote, we moved into one of the first of 30 buildings for a development plan to house 55,000. Yes, Co-op City was the end of the earth, but once I saw the apartment, it made sense. It had parquet floors and a big window in the living room with a long view. All the rooms were twice the size of those cubby holes in the projects. There's probably still a lesson to be learned here. Thanks. Okay, so hello again. Um, we have reached today's uh, final paper uh, before um, I will leave the, the floor to our main character uh, today, uh, Denise Capron. I'm happy to share my uh, paper uh, on another 50th anniversary. Uh, namely uh, that of Siam in 1978. On the afternoon of July the 1st, 1978, about 150 people gathered at the Chateau de la Serra, a castle perched on a hill overlooking the plains of Western Switzerland, not far from Geneva. They did so to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Siam, the International Congresses of Modern Architecture, founded at the castle in 1928. And here we see a photo from that occasion. It was founded on the initiative of Hélène de Mandreau, who was an important patron of the arts and architecture, and a group of 28 architects, uh, including Le Corbusier, and here we uh, see a scheme that he presented at that um, occasion. Um, and 50 years after this event, during a two day seminar entitled Meaning and Architectural Expression, the medieval stronghold became a convergence point for currents of 20th century architecture. Um, on the one hand of the functionalist tradition, represented by original members of Siam, such as Henri Robert von der Mühl and Alberto Satoris, both present in 1928, and Alfred Roth, who was not. Um, and on the other hand, um, of a new interest in communication in architecture, represented by Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi. Interestingly, there are no known photos of the seminar in 1978, very much unlike the event in 1970, uh, 1928. So um, the event took place during a reappraisal of the CM doctrine and was characterized by an ambivalent duality of celebration and critique. And the critique had been uttered internally already during the summer school in Venice, as we saw uh, earlier um, in, in the paper by uh, Denise Costanzo. So CM had been very influential. They had been the voice of the modern movement, promoting rationalization and a vision of the functional city divided in zones as described in the Athens Charter of 1933. And the ideas were implemented on a large scale after the Second World War. And Alfred Roth, again, who we see here on the left, was not present at the foundation of Siam, but he worked with Le Corbusier on the competition for the League of Nations in Geneva and on the Athens Charter as well. 
So these um, CM inspired uh, renewal projects were soon criticized for the negative impact on aesthetics and social structure of cities, among others by uh, Jane Jacobs. Um, we know this critique. So at this point in time, uh, in 1978, the functionalist tradition was being replaced by a new discourse on language and meaning in architecture. And Scott Brown and Venturi's um, uh, criticized, uh, criticized CM functionalism for uh, neglecting this aspect of architecture. And we see how the language of the events description is indebted to this discourse on sign theory and, and language in architecture. Uh, and I quote, the deep meaning of an architectural expression often remains hidden from users, spectators, and even specialists. On the other hand, through physical objects, it can acquire a stable image and become a sign. So this is how, how they express themselves. And this is translated from, from French. Um, so, but... The argument uh, and, and this uh, duality between uh, functionalism, the traditional functionalism and a new interest in, in communication um, was expanded in the contribution by Scott Brown. Her lecture added a social and political dimension uh, to the largely formalist debate, arguing for user participation and preservation of the existing urban fabric, a consequential message as um, seen in the accounts of media representatives and students who attended the seminar. And her concern for urban meaning and readability uh, was seen already in her essay, The Meaningful City, published in 1965, which we have seen earlier today. So on February the 2nd, 1978, the organizer of the seminar, Pierre Bechler, sent a letter of invitation to Mrs. and Mr. Venturi. Um, Bechla was a well-connected architect with office in La Sarra, who referred to their mutual friend, Jean-Marc Lamounier. And Lamounier knew that Scott Brown's parents lived in Geneva, which increased the likeliness of a positive response. So in early June, uh, Scott Brown confirmed their participation um, and their arrival in Geneva on June 30, as we see on the itinerary on the right. And on the morning of the conference on July 1st, Scott Brown, Venturi, and their young son reached the small town of La Serra, checked in at the Hotel de Ville, and joined the welcome lunch for the speakers. Afterward, on their way to the castle, they possibly passed by the Chapelle Saint-Ouane, where the group photo, photo of the first CM Congress had been taken. And I show you this to, to give you an idea of this place, La Sarra, and the walkability uh, of it. And they, they might indeed had uh, walked from the, the uh, hotel to, to the castle. And arriving at the castle, uh, they likely gazed at it, its two imposing towers uh, from the 13th century embedded in a park with large trees. And the seminar was held in this structure, wooden barn on the premises. Um, and the first day included a three hour session, starting out presentations by the Italian architect Alberto Sartoris, one of the original founders of CM, followed by one of the Swiss art, art historian Jacques Kubler and another by the Swiss architect Mario Botta. And the moderator, René Berger, announced that a presentation by Venturi, as he writes in his notes, uh, had been moved to Sunday afternoon, probably due to difficulty in finding a projector for the large American slides. Um, and after presentations of, uh, by Vittorio Grigotti, Michael Ragon, and Jean-Marc Lamounier. So, and Berger's uh, notes um, largely leave out Scott Brown, as we see here. And this lapse um, seems to have been symptomatic for the event. And Jacques Gubler, one of the, the speakers, comments in hindsight um, in an email that Scott Brown was regarded as an accompaniatrice, not as an architect. She was treated and respected as the wife of the speaker, even though she was herself listed as a speaker in the program. So 
At La Serra, Scott Brown and Venturi gave two separate lectures with very different content. The two themes were in fact proposed already in the invitation, suggesting that at least the organizers knew uh, the distinction between their interests well. So we had social environment and architectural expression and political ideologies and architectural expression. Yeah, those were the, the titles of their talks. Um, so they were rescheduled and, and spoke last at the event, uh, which was um, lamented by the art historian Armand Goulart in his article for the newspaper Journal de Genève. And um, their lectures are um, discussed prominently in his article, um, in, uh, where he notes that Venturi's message was, I quote, the exact opposite to that of the CM prophet uh, Le Corbusier. Um, and, but we can also um, see, we can get further clues uh, about the, the content of these lectures by looking at the notes um, by the Swiss architect and writer Lisbeth Sachs, and uh, these uh, are from the archive at ETH. The GTA uh, archive. And um, Sachs considered that Venturi's presentation was an anti CM manifesto, uh, in which he argued for the decorated shed and symbols which speak to the user. And I don't know which images he showed, but maybe it could, could, have, could have been uh, this building, uh, the showroom for best projects, um, as she, she mentions floral uh, patterns. So Scott Brown's lecture uh, can similarly be reconstructed using the notes by, by Sachs, in which she mentions urban planning without the Athens Charter. Um, but luckily we also have these notes by Scott Brown herself. So um, the, these are of course a great help as well. And they are held uh, in the architectural archives at the University of Pennsylvania. So her alternative to the Athens Charter was informed by her social planning education. It included supporting existing communities, as we have seen um, in, in the presentation by Sarah Moses, and was exemplified uh, in projects for Fairmont Manor, for instance, and South Street. And Brulard comments, um, in these projects, um, Yes, so um, as we, we see here, his comments again. Um, so in these projects, Scott Brown and her team, uh, I quote, examines what exists, draws up analysis, suggests proposals inspired by the inhabitants themselves, uh, as he writes. And the strategy involves self-help and participation of the affected low-income population, but also preservation of the existing building stock. So this approach of preservation and, uh, and participation uh, characterized Scott Brown's work on projects for the Warehouse Street to Strand in Galveston, Texas, and the coal, um, old coal mining city of Jim Thorpe in Pennsylvania. And these are only two uh, examples. You see um, uh, others uh, here in the notes. And these two projects, Galveston and Jim Thorpe, uh, deal with the preservation and reuse of Old main, uh, of old ma main streets, I can, can say, threatened by demolition or neglect. So they are not car-oriented environments, uh, but address the perceptual needs of pedestrians, actually, and this is an aspect which also often gets um, forgotten. So in Jim Thorpe, the strategy uses a rich Victorian architectural heritage to promote the means of livelihood of residents, as Brown writes in her notes. And in these projects, she worked within the establishment to combine economic revitalization, reuse and building preservation. Um, two uh, important strategies are, are shown here, uh, the photographic survey, and stylistic analysis of buildings um, documented in measured drawings. So uh, a few more uh, drawings, um, a bird's eye uh, perspective of Jim Thorpe. We see the railway station, the river, the Victorian Main Street. And we see similar strategies used in the um, project for Galveston in the revitalization action plan for the warehouse, old warehouse street, the Strand. So uh, the architects um, 
Scott Brown in particular, um, <clears throat> were commissioned by the by a local foundation for history to study new use for the area and also here a, a historical commercial street um, with, um, with Victorian era buildings, neo-Greek and, and art deco structures, um, as you see on the, the photos. So the office did detailed studies, uh, economic and tra transportation and cultural aspects uh, in, in collaboration with the residents. And these images um, uh, are slides which were shown at an exhibition in Zurich in 1979. Um, at least the, the ones uh, underneath here. And um, so, so that they were shown only one year after the, the lecture in La Sera. So, so it, it could well be that uh, these uh, images were shown. Um, and the motto of these projects um, were indeed, Main Street is almost all right. Um, though these little old main streets are far from the Vegas Strip. So here it is about, again, preservation of architectural heritage for economic, social, and aesthetic reasons without removing the local population. And Scott Brown combined her knowledge of architecture, preservation, construction, as well as economics and, and social anthropology. And commenting on this um, in, in 2021, Scott Brown explains uh, her argument in favor of small uh, interventions, make little plans. And this is also written in her notes. Um, and, and here she, she turns Daniel Burnham's dictum into a radically humble statement. And also quoting her colleague, uh, David Crane, she says that planning a city is like drawing on a river. And the river takes the clarity away and eventually it dissolves into nothing. So we see in these, in these statements, um, we see how the complexity of cities makes the implementation of universal grand schemes futile and dangerous. And she sees the lack of modesty among her fellow architects uh, who are often regarded as all-knowing perfect vision planners with long-time plans for the year 2020. Meanwhile, people are starving right at their doorsteps, uh, she explained uh, in 2021. So um, this is a, as you hear, it's a mix of, of her notes and, and the way she explained them to me uh, afterward, but I, it's, yeah, um, it's, it's, Fascinating to, to get this insight into her lecture back, uh, back in uh, 1978. And this message was not lost on the audience in 78. Brillat wrote admiringly of uh, Scott Brown's conviction. And he commented that the two voices from America did not propose any great new idea, no theory, no recipe, but the meaning of their concrete work, committed not to the service of clients or municipalities, but to the service of people uh, and communities. So this was in stark contrast to the morning lecture by the architectural critic Michel Ragon, who, as Brulard noted, presented utopias of the 1960s and the technical nightmares of the megalopolis of the future, stating that architects must be interested in megastructures in the cities that would be built under the earth, under the sea, etc. a perspective that did not leave the students indifferent. Um, and the architecture students present at La Serra were not the only ones who objected to Ragon's polemical presentation. Scott Brown and the Zurich architect Alfred Roth, as we saw earlier, chatting during a break, agreed that visions such as those of Artigram were frightening. As Scott Brown recalls that Roth was horrified by Artigram and uh, was likely relieved that she, despite being known as a pop architect, did not agree with the British visionaries. So Scott Brown recalls how she compared the visions of Siam and Artigram, criticizing both for ignoring the quality of the town as an incremental entity, uh, as they had already written in Learning from Las Vegas. So, and in the general discussion, Roth had himself become a subject of critique for his own large scale products, but that is another story. Um, so 
Looking back, Scott Brown was delighted at how well she and the CM member Rot got along. She knew another side of his work, uh, namely his Dollertal houses in Zurich, um, designed with uh, Emil Roth and Michael Breyer, uh, to which she had been introduced by her longtime friend Robert Middleton uh, when they were students. And Middleton knew of the projects from a, a book by Roth, New Architecture, as we see here. And Roth, who had objected initially to the presence of the American couple uh, in a letter to Jacques Gublet, might have been mollified by their shared aversion to Archigram. And uh, a few years later, Roth would write critically on Roberto Venturi, as he writes in an article, uh, but he doesn't mention Scott Brown in this article. So this is curious. We don't know why, uh, we can only speculate. Um, so he criticizes Venturi's take on, on decoration in, in that article. Um, and that critique by Roth on Venturi's take on decoration was shared by some of the younger generation in the audience. Marc Angel Lille, who would later teach at ETH uh, for 25 years, uh, attended the seminar at La Sarra as a student. And he recalls, I quote, I remember that a small group of students who were studying with Aldo van Eyck at ETH went um, to La Sarra to specifically see and hear what Robert Venturi had to say. Venturi showed a lot of flower motifs uh, that he was secretly applying on facades and furniture. This was somehow disappointing to us. However, the big surprise was Denise Scott Brown, who talked about social issues and the role of politics in architecture, urban design and planning. In hindsight, her lecture marked my future development, though I did not know at the time how, how influential she would turn out to be. And Scott Brown gave a similar lecture one year later in November 79 to a packed auditorium at ETH. And Angelil volunteered as an assistant, uh, handling the slides at the back, not missing out on the opportunity to hear Scott Brown speak a second time. So the balancing act between critique and celebration at La Serra 78 was, re was received with mixed emotions. The student Francois de Wolf recalled in 2021, uh, back then a student, that the event did not live up to, his, to the grandiose setting. Scott Brown, however, looks back at the event with, with fondness. Uh, as the first time she and Venturi went public in Switzerland, uh, end quote, uh, judging from comments and media accounts, her contribution was one of the most consequential, even though she was treated as the wife of the speaker. Scott Brown extended the discussion about meaning in architecture to the scale of the city and its inhabitants, offering a viable alternative to Siam-inspired tabula rasa urban renewal. Presenting her work and ideas at La Serra, Scott Brown took part as a practitioner and innovative thinker in her own right, and her opposition to the Athens Charter would be a constant throughout her work, and her strategy of little plans, her advocacy for keeping existing structures, is an early example of dealing with the given, with, uh, which combined her social, economic, and functional concerns and are highly relevant today, especially in the light of the ongoing climate crisis. Thank you. Please, uh, Denise, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I've got about three points only. But um, the, first, the first one is um, a little bit more about La Serras. It was my great pride and joy that I gave that lecture in French. And even that did not amaze them. I said, would you like it in English with nuances or in French rather simple? And they said, we love your Parisian accent. Please do it in French. And I didn't know I had a Parisian accent, but so that was amusing. And then um, 
well, let me think of what the other stories were. Um, th there's another one about um, a tragedy in our lives now, which is we are about to lose the Sainsbury wing of the National Gallery. It's about to be so altered and so ruined that it will not be the same. And we're, we know that something is going to happen to Wu, Wu Hall as well. And um, also, I think there's one other that's going to be altered. And there's a lot being written about that. And I would like to ask you as an audience to look up some of that and inundate them with complaints. Tell them the whole of the world is looking at them and what do they think they are doing and tell them everything. Because even although it's passed twice, there's evidence that it was wrongly done and um, done for the sake of developers wanting to acquire historic properties. Ours was the first one to go because they, they thought it's not very big and a lot of people don't like it. But you take away ours and the next thing you've got in the grade one listing is all the Gothic cathedrals in England. So which one are they thinking of taking next? Someone's thinking it's going to be a good site for a new development. Remember what happened with the Smithsons buildings? That's what happened. And I think that's the reason why we got that listing so that they would then be able to use ours to make a, a, a precedent for losing grade one listed buildings. So anyone who's hearing this, who has any sort of soul for any of those buildings, it would be wonderful if you nevertheless complain to them. I think they are scared of publicity. Of course, there are people there in England who say we can't sleep at night for thought of it. But then there's another point, and that is um, to do with, uh, I'm not forgetting that one too, to do with what um, Frida has been saying. Now, I've done that one. The last one is about um, the Siam. You know, Le Corbusier formulated that thought about um, cities and donkeys and all of that in uh, uh, the, the ideas is the first sign of it, although he also went traveling in Illyria, as it used to be called, Yugoslavia now, and saw a lot of donkeys there, I'm sure. He, he traveled that as a young man. So he had the theory about donkeys. Um, and then I, I begin to realize that what, we need a bag of tools for dealing with urbanism, we as architects, in ways we can understand them. Le Corbusier was right to, to want to formulate, I would call it not a, a, aesthetic, a, a, a charter, but a bag of tools. Let's make it a workable, not scary thing, a small bag of tools, and say, you need this kind of information before you can do anything about a city in the same way as you need to know what supports a beam before you can design a building. And in designing renewal and big building projects and even small ones, you need to know these things and they're not hard to learn. So if people could think of it in that way, um, I think the next thing would be for people who want to think in that way, I did get to write seven chapters and they are around in the archive of determinants of urban form, influenced by Dave Crane. He wanted to do it with me and he had no time and I did it on my own. But it does begin to make a start of doing that and it wouldn't be hard to do it. And I, I start with saying, this is, a, this is a busy crossroad. Where can you see this? Can you see it? No, you can't see it anywhere. Can you see it here? Yeah. Yes. This is a busy crossroad. Now, if this is a crossroad, where are you going to put the skyscraper? Of course, they say here. Where will you put the store? Somewhere back here. Where will you put the Levittown house? Oh, somewhere here. They've just elucidated cent what's it called? central planning theory. And it comes out of urban economics, but it's very understandable. And there, was a, there were two um, gurus 
at Penn around architecture. There were people who didn't know the other one. One was Lucan, and the other one was Walter Isard. And he invented this way of approaching the pattern making that forces make on form in cities. And it can be the natural forces of things we know about so well now, what they do to urban form. It can be the, the stone, um, stone physiognomy of areas, but it's also the, the social behavior and the, um, the structural growth of populations and things like that. Knowing enough about them to make patterns of them, to understand how the patterns form. And that's what we have used for years now as the basis of the first party of many of our complex projects. And that is not hard to learn. And if you want to see some rather basic ones, the chapters Denise Costanza quoted from Signs and Systems in Cities, do an outline of it, activity patterns and other kinds of patterns. And it's worth reading, it's very readable. And it does help you to do that. Then there come other ways of forming buildings and plans, but usually it's, a, it's another scale. The first ones are like at a quarter mile radius from where your project is, something like that. So that's what I have to say. It's been a joy to listen. It's, it's been a charming thing. And I hope that, um, that some of you will think about these things. Au revoir. Bye-bye. Ciao. Guten Abend. I don't know what it is you want at Yale, but I think you've got it all there. Thank you, Denise. Denise, don't go away just yet, okay? It's Deborah. Okay. Can you see me? I don't know if I you can see, see me or you, not. Deborah. No. I can't see you, I should tell you one other thing, Deborah. It's not your fault. It's that last meeting at Yale that where, where our um, work was made into a show, and then we, there was a conference, rather like this, a day's conference on a Saturday, no, on a Friday, maybe a couple of days. And it was a, a pretty nice conference, and I helped a lot with the show, and I've done all the descriptions and all of that, designed a little seminar area in the show itself so people could sit and learn. And um, when it came to the conference, it turned out I wasn't going to be in it. Thank what? you, Bob Stern. Thank I was going to say, Stern. I wasn't Dean then, because no, that wouldn't no, have happened. Bob, <laughs> yeah. So what happened was, um, he said, yes, you'll be in it on Saturday. And everyone left on Friday. So I gave it to the students. And the students went and told, Tom, uh, told Bob Stern that I'd given the best lecture of all. <laughs> and, uh, that is to, and now with the National Gallery and Mr. Finaldi there, the new director, he has chosen not to know I'm an architect. And he came to our house because he knew he had to meet with us with the architects and I was there. He decided I must be a lady donor. What else could I be? What a charming house, he says. He don't even recognize it as perhaps being by... Um, um, what's the name? Um, not not uh, Margaret McDonald, McDonald Mac, Macintosh and Charles Rennie Macintosh. That building, the inside woodwork is very likely by them. The people were Germans and it was done before he died and it looks very like his work. He didn't recognize any of that, trained though he was at Courtauld. And then he's, he, later he says, um, oh, well, um, he... He drafts a letter for his people to write to the conference people, and he says, um, he mentions um, Denise Scott Brown. Um, how does he put it? Denise Scott Brown. Um, Denise Scott Brown, wife of Venturi, 90 years old. And I'm like, don't, don't listen to her. So that's the guy I'm asking you to write to his employers and tell them he's doing the wrong thing and <laughs> the whole world is looking at him, at them. Everybody in this room is going to write after your impassioned speech. Yes. Um, I uh, 
first and foremost, want, want to thank you. And I say this as a woman architect and actually as someone trained as a planner uh, for being an inspiration uh, for women of my generation. And I trust for women younger than I as well, because I've gotten pretty old myself. So I want to thank you and uh, thank you for participating today. Thank you for all the great work you've done. And thank you for being an inspiration to so many of us, women, students, architects, yeah. planners, and citizens of the world. Um, I also want to thank uh, Frida for pulling this conference together. We had many hundreds of participants online. Uh, so thank you to all of them. Thank you for everybody who spoke and uh, for our moderators. Thank you to the J. Irwin Miller Fund here at the School of Architecture that helped support this event. And again, thank you, Denise. We, um, we have a tradition here that's not a Bob Stern tradition. Uh, <laughs> We don't drink martinis. Uh, we actually have a drink appropriate to the person being honored and celebrated because that's much more hospitable. And one thing architects and planners need to be is actually hospitable. Um, so uh, Andrew Benner, who is a faculty member and uh, who runs our gallery now is also a bit of a mixologist in his own right. And he found a drink, uh, served at the Sky Bar in the Waldorf Astoria in Las Vegas. And it is actually called The Strip. It's a <laughs> cocktail called The Strip. So I'm sorry you won't be with us at tonight's reception in your honor, but you are definitely with us in spirit and as an inspiration. So we will be serving this gin and elderflower cocktail, The Strip in the toast. reception this evening in your honor. <laughs> drink, drink a toast to us. We definitely will. Thank yes. you so much.